Hi everyone, welcome back to Mr. Mesher's Lessons, and in today's video I am going to be covering The Devil and Tom Walker, which is a short story by Washington Irving, and it was originally published in 1824. It's a bit of an early American writing, but it is certainly interesting, and I, I really enjoyed it. It's one of the most enjoyable short stories from the 19th century that I've read in a long time. Getting right into Washington Irving's background, he was a writer during the 19th century. He wrote two other pieces. He wrote Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and his stories were really fun to read with an interesting plot, and they had a really unique writing style. And after you have read The Devil and Tom Walker, you'll certainly see this pop out. And especially if you've read either Rip Van Week or The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I've always thought of a lot of his stories were just amazing to be read to. So if you can find an audio recording of one of these and listen to it, it's such an enjoyable experience. And Washington Irving's writing style has such a unique flair to it. And it makes his stories pop out so much more. As I said earlier, the two other most popular short stories that he wrote were Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I was extremely connected to Rip Van Winkle, but The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, I didn't enjoy as much. I think Rip Van Winkle had a lot of humor in it that I enjoyed reading from Irving and... Thankfully, The Devil and Tom Walker has a lot of this as well. So on the screen now, I've got the plot summary, which was provided by enotes.com. They have a nice plot summary on their website, and I just took a general idea from their summary of The Devil and Tom Walker. But essentially what happens is that Tom Walker is walking home one day to his wife and takes a shortcut through a swamp. And he ends up running into the devil who is named Old Scratch. He goes by a couple different names, but he's mostly referred to as Old Scratch in the story. The devil sees Tom coming and knows a sucker from a mile away. He offers Tom the buried treasure, but Tom has to give the devil his soul. Tom says no to the devil. He decides that he's going to do this in spite of his wife and he is in a constant state of bickering. They are not a happy couple. So he goes home to report this, but not before realizing that the swamp that he's walking through, the woods that the devil is living in, oh, it's got a lot of trees waiting to bury very nefarious people from the story, which will be a foreshadowing to the later death of even Tom Walker, who has his own tree. Tom gets home and he tells his wife about this, and his wife is not too happy that he turned down the deal, so she goes out and gets the devil herself. If Tom's not going to make a deal with the devil for him, his soul, she's going to make a deal with the devil with her soul. She takes some of their valuables and she goes there, tries to make a deal with the devil, and apparently it goes a little haywire because in the story she ends up dying and it's alleged that the devil took her out with a bit of a fight. Tom goes back to see if he can find his wife and admittedly he is looking more for the goods and the treasures of his his home than he is looking for his wife and it turns out that she's gone which he's actually relieved by and he decides that he will take the deal with the devil himself which he does and the devil wants him to work initially as a slave trader Tom Walker refuses to do this, but rather becomes a money lender, and man, does he have an evil streak as a money lender. It's interesting in the story how Irving makes such a spectacle that Tom Walker would not want to be a slave trader, but he's so quick to take up the merciless money lending that he does, and it's it just makes for a really interesting discussion, and eventually Tom Walker's bad habits catch up to him he lends money out at such a high rate and he ends up taking people's homes and it gets the best of him before i hopped into the discussion of the story i wanted to include some vocabulary that i had experienced while reading the devil and tom walker i thought these were very interesting words and maybe not words that some of my students may have encountered before so i thought i'd give a quick overview we've got a few different words termagant avarice Usurer, El Dorado, 
ostentation, parsimony, and egad, which is an exclamation. Termagant is a harsh-tempered or overbearing woman. That's a noun. Avarice is extreme greed for wealth or material gain. Man is Tom Walker filled with that. A usurer is a person who lends money at unreasonably high rates of interest. Cough, cough. The federal government and student loans. Cough, cough. And El Dorado is a place of fabulous wealth or opportunity, and I put in italics here that it is of legend. Ostentation is a boastful display of wealth, which once Tom Walker finds all of his wealth, he is happy to show it off. And parsimony is extreme unwillingness to spend money or use resources. And Tom actually embodies this perhaps even more than his ostentatious personality in this story, some of his horses are starving because he won't feed them enough, yet he walks around with a feather in his cap. Egad, it's just an exclamation, and it can be anywhere from surprise to affirmation. It's not seen so much anymore, so I wasn't sure if my students would have encountered this before, so I thought I'd throw it in there as well. Next, we've got the list of characters here. There are a total of six characters on my list. There's not a whole lot of characters in The Devil and Tom Walker, but the ones that are in there are pretty important. Uh, the first is the main character, you know, Tom Walker. He is a bit of a meager, miserly fellow. He's not, just not a good guy. He's kind of a tightwad. He's kind of like Scrooge McDuck, but almost to a next level. Old Scratch, he is the devil. He is the incarnation of the devil in the story. And he is occasionally described in the story as a black man, but... In truth, he is a... We don't know what race he is. He, he's just covered in soot, and he's got black hair, and he lives in the woods where he plans to take people's souls. Tom's wife is even worse than Tom, and she's kind of abusive toward him, both physically and verbally. They, they don't get along, and she's certainly overbearing on her husband to a point that is almost uncomfortable. Surprisingly, though, Irving frames this as not too big of a deal. Another character who's never actually introduced but is spoken about is Captain Kidd, the one pirate who buried the treasure in the swamp and got Tom Walker interested in selling his soul, he was actually taken into custody and killed before he could get to enjoy any of the riches that he buried in the woods. So unfortunately, he worked so hard nefariously for the stolen riches and didn't get a chance to lavish them. The land jobber is described as Tom's best friend, but what's interesting about this is that he tried to get rich quick by flipping land, and I think maybe people have seen this in the recent success and failure of Bitcoin. He borrows money from Tom after his plans fall through and goes to a point where he no longer can afford to pay Tom and Tom is just ruthless. He's not willing to work with the land jobber, and he's just, well, I guess the land jobber's out of luck. Or so we would think, because what ends up happening is that Tom Walker gets taken by the devil, and everybody gets their money back. All of his records of debt disappear. Deacon Peabody, he's not a super important person to the story, but I wanted to include him because he's the physical owner of the swamp, and he's he's a little bit of a crooked preacher. He scrutinizes sins of other people, but he's not so quick to feel bad about his own. He's got a tree in the swamp just for him. Old Scratch got his name on it. So he is being ready to go to the swamp. I included six points of discussion. These are just general topics that I wanted to cover, and... I think they each provide a very interesting and noteworthy attitude of the story and a backstory for how the Devil and Tom Walker functions. These are comedy, shock, foreshadowing, description, characterization, story impact, and bigger picture. The last one were more so points that I wanted to talk about and discuss, analyze, but the other five were points I wanted to take, and I thought they were pretty important excerpts from the story, and I think that 
If you're wanting to get a deeper look at The Devil and Tom Walker, these are really important to see. Comedy was the first section that I wanted to cover, and I think this story was hilarious. This was certainly one of the funniest short stories that I had read, and I wish that I had the chance to read this in high school. Because the story is just filled with comedy, it's filled with snarky remarks, and I, man, I just, I laughed and laughed and laughed. This was a wonderfully written story. First section I wanted to discuss was when Tom is looking for his wife and realizes that his wife ran off to the swamp to make a deal with the devil. It says, Tom now grew uneasy for her safety, especially as he found she had carried off in her apron the silver teapot and spoons, and every portable article of value. I found this part to be hilarious because he's worried about her safety, but he's not worried about her safety because he misses his wife and doesn't want her to get hurt. She took all the goods. She took them all and ran off, and I thought this part was just really funny, and it just kind of really showed what kind of person Tom Walker is, but more so what kind of person Tom Walker's wife was. The second part is a little description of his wife, and it says that he was a hard-minded fellow, and he wasn't easily daunted, and he had lived so long with a termagant wife that Tom Walker doesn't even fear the devil at that point because he's already living with her, essentially. I thought this part was really funny, and the trope of an overbearing wife and unhappy wife has been replicated in lots of modern comedy. I thought it was a really interesting touch here, and one that I wasn't expecting to see so early from a 19th century writer, but I was I was very happy to read this. This was this made me laugh. Going on to the female condescending trope of an overbearing wife, Irving writes that though a female scold is generally considered a match for the devil, yet in this instance she appears to have had the worst of it. And I still take this as kind of a lighthearted jab at overbearing women, termagant women, as he refers to them as. It's in such a light way that it sticks to the comedy without being condescending or rude towards women and I found it to be really funny. I thought this was a great example of Irving's comedy. Next we see that Tom has found his wife or rather his wife's apron which has the valuables in it and his response to this is hey let's get the stuff and forget about the wife. <laughs> Obviously Tom wasn't happy with his wife but I would have thought that he would have felt a little remorse or a little bad that he told his wife about the devil, and she went and died. But I guess at least Tom found the pots and is over it. Irving includes a bit of comedy towards religion in this aspect. It's, I guess, a bit of satire. He says, Indeed, one might always tell when he had sinned most during the week by the clamor of his Sunday devotion. I wasn't actually sure what a devotion was. I had to look into this. But this, this was quite funny that Irving takes a slight jab at religion where he says in a satirical statement, Indeed, one might always tell when he had sinned most during the week by the clamor of his Sunday devotion. I thought this was an interesting line, but I also thought it was kind of funny. We all know someone down and dirty on Saturday, but nice and clean on Sunday. And I, th I thought this was a really interesting part. I Once again, I didn't expect to see this in a 19th century writing. But this was quite funny. I, I think this... One of the things that makes The Devil and Tom Walker so enjoyable is that it feels like a trope that is often used in modern writing, whether it's in television or movies. I think it's used a lot in modern writing, and it sticks out really well here because of how different it is and how just shocking it is. It's just quite unexpected to see in a 19th century writing style. The last part of the comedy, and maybe this could go a bit into the shock category, Tom says he loses his patience with the land jobber, and he says, the devil take me if I had made a farthing. <laughs> Tom is just saying, oh, I've barely made any money from this. I don't even know what you're talking about. And look at that, there's three loud knocks on the kitchen door. Th this just really stuck out as a great example of why I think this was modern comedy. I know I I've said that three or four times now, but when I read this, I thought back to an episode of Family Guy where 
Lois says, God kill me if, God strike me with lightning if I was lying. And she gets stricken by lightning. I just thought it was a really funny example of Irving's writing and just a bit more of lathering on his irony and something I wasn't personally expecting. We've all heard someone say, well, if God didn't want me to do it, he'd stop me. But looks like the devil is actually coming and stopping Tom Walker. <laughs> the next section I wanted to cover pretty quickly was shock. I had two quotes from there and after laughing that Tom was more excited that his pots were not gone than he was about his wife you know being dead and nowhere to be seen. Her, her liver's sitting with her apron. He says that the devil has done him a kindness and he wanted to cultivate a further acquaintance with him. This was I, when I read this, I, I was laughing a bit when I was leading up to this point. But when it says this, you're just like, oh my goodness. I cannot believe that Tom Walker, he's he's a savage. I could not believe that he was so willing to, well, the devil killed my wife. So I guess I'll be his friend now. That was just quite a shocking idea from the story. And it certainly got me off guard. The next section that had a bit of shock for me was where Tom Walker was negotiating his work with the devil, what he would do to bring more money to himself was when Tom Walker agreed to be a money lender in Boston. And it was, it was quite comical because the devil says, you shall lend money at 2% a month, which is an extremely high amount. If Tom Walker is just lending money out, and that's the only thing he's doing, 2% a month is extremely high interest. But what's even more shocking about this is that this isn't even really that high in comparison to some of the interest rates that the United States has now. And I, it was shocking to see that this... Tom Walker's just going to lend the money out, no questions asked to these people. But then he says, oh, I'll charge four. Forget about it, devil. I'll, I'll one-up you. I, I was just, wow, Tom Walker, he is playing no games. He is here to make money and not friends. But he does not even have a soft spot for his best friend, the land jobber. One of Irving's many strong suits is that his characterization is very on point for the various characters in The Devil and Tom Walker, and we see this a lot through Tom Walker himself. He's described as a meager, miserly fellow, and his wife is as miserly as himself. His wife is, a little later on, described as a hen could not cackle, but she was on alert to secure the new laid egg. When I read this, I was like, oh man, he's really, really laying on the smack with his wife, but his wife is admittedly even more of a tight wad than Tom Walker is, and I thought this was quite interesting. The next is directly with Tom Walker, and it says that he was jumping for joy because he saw his wife's apron, and it had the valuables. Tom Walker is just such a shallow and uninvested person to any individual he'll turn his back on you at any point and this line really shows that tom walker plays no games he you better not mess with his stuff he might care about his wife but he does not care about his wife nearly as much as he cares about his belongings tom walker's wife is again described early in the story as loud of tongue and strong of arm her voice was heard in wordy warfare with her husband, and his face sometimes showed sign that their conflicts were not confined to words. One of the things that Irving does really well is he doesn't directly state that Tom Walker was beaten by his wife. He doesn't directly state many things, but they are strongly implied, and it requires kind of a little bit of a closer reading. So during my first reading, I didn't quite realize that um, Tom Walker's wife was kind of beaten on him. I didn't realize that at first. And the characterization that Irving gives for Tom Walker's wife was just quite interesting. And I thought it was a very exemplary showing of what kind of person she was. Next is after Tom Walker became rich. And man, is he living the life for himself. He sat in the counting house in his white linen cap and India silk morning gown. 
Ooh, that's a life of luxury. This sounds like it's straight out of a future song. He was on the point of foreclosing a mortgage by which he would complete the ruin of an unlucky land speculator for whom he had professed the greatest friendship. So what's surprising here is that he's... He just has no remorse. It says a little later the land jobber begged him to grant a few months indulgence. This guy's his best friend, and Tom Walker says himself that the land jobber was his best friend, but he plays no games. <laughs> Perhaps Tom Walker could have given him a little leniency, but no, Tom Walker needs the money, and if he can't get it, your house is mine, bud. The next line has a bit of juxtaposition and a lot of irony in the little bit that it contains. And I think this was a really important quote from the devil and Tom Walker that really, it gives characterization to Tom Walker, how extravagant he can live in a few lines before, but it shows how miserly he is. And I don't think a lot of stories really get that jab. And, you know, by the end of the story, Tom Walker is, he's no longer a neutral character. He's now a negative character. We don't really like him, it says. He even set up a carriage in the fullness of his vain glory, though he nearly starved the horses which drew it. And as the ungreased wheels groaned and screeched on the axle trees, you would have thought you heard the souls of the poor debtors he was squeezing. Man, does Irving do a wonderful job of describing. It's just, it's a beautiful characterization. It's descriptive. And I think this is an important line because it just shows how far Tom Walker's going to go so he can pinch those pennies and get that money. Irving has a wonderful way of describing. And in his writing, there's a lot of descriptive lines. That was shown a little bit in the previous section. But these lines were just a directly description. And I thought he had some beautiful language in here. The first section he writes, There were also dark and stagnant pools, the abodes of the tadpole, the bullfrog, the water snake, where the trunks of pines and hemlocks lay half drowned, half rotting, looking like alligators sleeping in the mire. I think Irving just has a really nice writing voice here, and it helps develop a sense of imagery with the swamp that the devil is in. And it's just a really interesting cluster of animals and man does it it sounds like a natural place but it also sounds like a place you wouldn't want to step your boots in the next line is talking about what happens after tom walker is taken by the devil it says in place of gold and silver his iron chest was filled with chips and shavings two skeletons lay in his stable instead of his half starved horses in the very next day, his great house took fire and was burned to the ground. Man, did Tom Walker's legacy reverse quickly. Not only did he ruin the life of his... Well, he attempted to ruin the life of his best friend, the land jobber. He, his wife was dead and gone, tried to make a deal with the devil. He was, he was left with no friends on earth, but now all his riches are gone just like that. Even worse than the fate of Captain Kidd, Tom Walker's... Money is gone, his house is burned up, and he is hated by the village. The last line, I thought it was an interesting contrast to describing people. He describes the horse. He says, a miserable horse whose ribs were as articulate as the bars of a gridiron, stalked about a field where a thin carpet of moss, scarcely covering the ragged belts of pudding stone, tantalized and balked his hunger. And sometimes he would lean his face over the fence, look piteously at the passerby, and seem to petition deliverance from this land of famine. One thing that I really appreciated in Irving's writing was that while his vocabulary and his syntax and his sentences was different than modern English and what we're used to reading in short stories and novels of the 21st century. I think this is a great example of how Irving can just go on and on without without bludgeoning us about the details, but he he can really describe a scene and since there wasn't any pictures included, this is a really great description. I, I think this is a great example of what students can aspire to describe a setting as because writing versus a video or picture you have to describe all of the things yourself and he goes into scant detail about this and it's just it's beautiful he says you know scarcely covering the ragged beds of pudding stone this horse really isn't living a good life and we can tell this so carefully by the writing that 
Irving includes in here. I included one excerpt of the foreshadowing that Irving does. It's included several parts throughout the story. Foreshadowing is used, but I just wanted to cover this one. Tom looked in the direction that the stranger pointed and beheld one of the giant trees, fair and flourishing without, but rotten at the core, and saw that it had been nearly hewn through, so that the first high wind was likely to blow it down. Man, it's kind of... I, the story later goes on to say that it is like Deacon Peabody, but wow, this is like Deacon Peabody, and he later dies, and what do you know, the tree ends up being where Deacon Peabody is laid to rest. The last section I wanted to include was a discussion section where I just wanted to talk about the implications of Irving's writing as well as a little bit of outside sources. So here I have two different sections. The first is the devil talking about how the Indians were kind of followed and killed in the United States. And the second section is talking about how Tom deals with his offer to be a slave trader. The first second, certainly Irving doesn't come off as an overly bearing social justice warrior, but the devil himself is is standing up to the red men, which is which is of course how Irving refers to the Indians. It says since the red men have been exterminated by you white savages, I assume myself by presiding at the persecutions of Quakers and Anabaptists. I am the great patron and prompter of slave dealers and the grand master of the Salem witches. This gives us a great introduction to Old Scratch, but it also it, it makes us feel a little bad for the red men, but also I guess Irving is pointing maybe this isn't so bad for the red men, I guess, in a bit of a satire sense, because now they don't have to deal with the devil. The Quakers and Anabaptists are now left to deal with the devil. The second section is where Tom is discussing with the devil how he is going to become rich. And Tom just refuses to be a slave trader. It's completely below him, apparently. Despite the fact that Tom can loan out money and he's willing to ruin people's lives by giving a large amount of money for essentially nothing and then charging a large interest rate back against it. Tom doesn't want to be a slave trader and this kind of speaks for Irving's feelings on slavery and I think this the fact that Tom Walker of all people refuses to be a slave trader and that the devil is so often a slave trader himself and a prompter of being a slave trader really shows that Irving is not cool with the slave trade and despite the fact that the devil is written as a black man but only in looks not of literal meaning Irving takes a great stand against enslavement of African Americans the enslavement of black people in the story as he refers to them and I thought this was just a really interesting line from a 19th century writing this was great I thought this was a wonderful addition to the story but what Irving does so well is that he doesn't directly speak about issues he hints around to them and it's almost implied so it's not an in your face like hey I don't like slavery it's more of a hey the devil wants to be a slave trader and even Tom Walker would refuse that so what does that mean for everyone else I think that's a great and powerful style of writing that Washington Irving uses and I think it really sets him apart from some of the writing of others. Another popular writer from the time was Benjamin Franklin and his writing is more it, it it's kind of in your face it's kind of like well I don't really like this and this is why whereas Tom Walker is alluding to the fact that Irving does not really appreciate slavery. And I thought this was just a great line and a great point of discussion I wanted to bring up. The last section I wanted to talk about was where the town has essentially went full-blown speculative. <laughs> they are, they're investing in the land and selling it. They're flipping it, doing it quickly. Maybe you've heard of people doing this with Pokemon cards, or maybe you've heard of it with Beanie Babies. Especially a few years ago, we saw Bitcoin just grow in value. The financial value of Bitcoin went up hundreds of times. People, I've read a few articles, people were investing, you know, they were taking out a second mortgage on their home to do this. It was just really surprising. And it, once again, over and over again, 
the devil and Tom Walker has exemplified a connection to the current time period. And this was just another one. I think it's just a recurring theme of the devil and Tom Walker. But I, I personally really connected this with investment in short-term profit to try to flip rather than actually slowly gain and do it. I wouldn't want to say the right way, but to carefully invest it just haphazardly. And I thought this was a really interesting section and I felt I felt strangely connected to it. I thought this section, the last, it was almost the very last section of the story where the devil shows up and he says, Tom, you're come for it. And he takes Tom away. But what's interesting here is that Tom actually had a Bible at his desk and a big Bible buried under the mortgage he was about to foreclose. And I think this really gave an interesting perspective as what Christianity really meant meant to Irving and what it meant to be a solid Christian. The idea that Tom was producing an image of a Christian man but was actually foreclosing the home of a family it was really shocking and it gave me great insight into this line made me think a lot about the devotion line from earlier in the story how you can tell a man sins by his devotion on Sunday and Tom Walker I'm sure he's sitting at his desk thinking oh I'm a good guy I'm reading my bible I you know I got, I got two bibles I'm doing double the value of a Christian so I must be a good guy that didn't help him because he was too invested in these mortgages and this just felt like a bit of a metaphor to the worldly possession of goods and services that so many people have become accustomed to. This wasn't even that big of an issue in the 19th century, so it was really shocking to read this, and I thought this was a great ending to the story. That's all I've got for The Devil and Tom Walker. I hope you've enjoyed this analysis. I certainly hope it's been helpful. I wanted to create this because as I am beginning my teaching, I wanted to have some outside resources my students could look to coming from a familiar voice and they could try to understand some of the stories we're going to be worth it, working with. So I wanted to say thanks and I hope that you can check out some of my other content and see what you think about it. Thanks for watching the video and I hope this has been helpful.